Thanks, Robin. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I only have 25 to 30 minutes with you. I wanted to, do the, the, I wanted to make the best of it. I want to talk to you um, about four things. Think of it like a ladder with four steps or a play with four acts. Um, first, I want to share with you a popular joke that's making rounds in Kurdish coffee shops in Turkey, in Iraq, in Syria, and in Iran. Then I want to throw some statistics at you. Draw a picture with numbers, if you will, of the Kurds and Kurdistan. Then I want to tell you a story, a real story, that took place in a prison in Turkey. And then I want to tell you about a girl, probably your age, maybe a little bit older, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And if we have time, I'd be happy to take your questions too. First, the story, the joke that's making rounds in the Kurdish coffee houses, coffee shops throughout the Middle East. There were two prisoners who were on a death row. One happened to be a Kurd, and the other one happened to be a Turk. As is the custom all over the world, when death row inmates are about to be hanged, they're asked for their last wishes. They asked the Kurdish inmate what was it that he wanted to do. He told the Turkish guards that he wanted to see his mother. He hadn't seen her for a while. He wanted to see her, and then he was ready to part. Then they asked the Turkish inmate, his fellow prisoner, what was it that he wanted? He said, and I quote, I don't want the Kurdish inmate to see his mother, end of quote. I know it's dark humor. <laughs> this is how it goes in the Kurdish coffee shops. <laughs> it's sad, I know. Such is the level of hatred and intolerance towards the Kurds. I didn't ask to be a Kurd. My sex, my parents, my nationality were given to me. And it is a sorry lot. You don't want to be a Kurd. <laughs> Count your blessings for being an American. I know you, I know your country, I know your schools, and I'm a Kurt. And I, said, I say this from the bottom of my heart. Now, the second ladder, second step of the ladder, some statistics. We have the dubious distinction of being the largest stateless people on the face of the earth. No one knows how many Kurds live in the Middle East because it's against the law to count the Kurds. But we number, we figure, we estimate some 35 to 40 million Kurds in the world. Uh, 
About 20 million Kurds live in Turkey. About 5 million Kurds live in Iraq. About 8 to 10 million Kurds live in Iran. And about 2 million Kurds live in Syria. Our language is banned. Our songs are prohibited. Our culture is slated for extinction. There's cultural genocide in Turkey, in Iran, in Syria, and in Iraq up until 2003. We are the indigenous people of the Middle East. We are the children of the soil, if you will. We are the original people. We have lived on our mountains since time immemorial. Our language survived the Stone Age, the Middle Ages, the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment. But in 1920s, when the map of the Middle East was put together, primarily by the European colonialists, we found ourselves in Iraq and Syria, in Iran and in Turkey. And these countries then decided to do, to do away with their Kurdish populations. I lived in Turkey until I was 19. Then I came here. I've been blessed with a good, solid, liberal education in this country. I used to live in California. I had my family there. We had a family business. But in 80s and early 90s, horrible news kept coming from Turkey, where our villages were being destroyed. The loved ones that I knew were being tortured, and people that I had gone to school with were being killed. So in 93, I left California. I went to DC. I set up a nonprofit American Kurdish Information Network to raise awareness about the Kurds, to lobby the US Congress, to stand in front of audiences like this one, to pull my hair, if you will, <laughs> to hit my chest, to stand on my head, to plead my people's case. <laughs> 